no gut, no glory. Pursuers of any great goal can tell you that. In the human psyche, from the moment a newborn baby emerges into the light of day, he or she has a desire for magic. We are told this is an early fetish that fades away as the experience of the world sets in, as maturity evolves, as practical reality is better understood. In most areas of psychology, sensible adjustment to practical reality is a great prize to be won by the patient. It marks the passage from child to adult. It is hailed as a therapeutic triumph. In truth, the desire for magic never goes away, and the longer it is buried, the greater the price a person pays. A vaccine against a disease can mask the visible signs of that disease, but under the surface, the immune system may be carrying on a low-level chronic war against toxic elements of the vaccine, and the effects of the war can manifest in odd forms. So it is with the inoculation of reality aimed at suppressing magic. One of the byproducts of the reality shot is depression. The person feels cut off from the very feeling and urge he once considered a hallmark of life. Therefore, chronic sadness. And of course, one can explain that sadness in a variety of ways, none of which gets to the heart of the matter. It is assumed that so-called primitive cultures played magic front and center because they couldn't do better. They couldn't formulate a true and rational religion with a church and monks and collection plate and a European choir and an array of pedophiles. They couldn't fathom what real science was. Their impulse for magic had to be defamed and reduced and discredited. Why? Obviously, because the Westerners who were poking through ancient cultures like demented professors had already discredited magic in themselves. They had put it on a dusty shelf in a room in a cellar beyond the reach of their own memory. But they couldn't leave it alone. They had to keep worrying it, scratching it, and so they journeyed thousands of miles to find it somewhere else. And then, they scoffed at it and tried to crush it. And we wonder why, under the banner of organized religion, there has been so much killing. At a deep level, the adherents know they've sold their souls, and they're depressed, angry, resentful, remorseful, and they want to assuage and expiate their guilt through violence. But the urge for magic is forever. And yet the charade goes on. While playing homage and lip service to ordinary practical reality, seasoned with a bit of fairy tale organized religion, people actually want to change reality. They want to reveal their latent paranormal power. They want to get outside reality. They want to create realities that, by conventional standards, are deemed impossible. And they want to find and use their own magic. In our modern culture, we're taught that everything is learned as a system. That, you could say, is the underlying assumption of education. It has far-reaching consequences. It leads to the systemizing of the mind. The mind is shaped to accommodate this premise. If I want to know something, I have to learn it. Somebody has to teach it to me. They will teach it as a system. I will learn the system. I will elevate the very notion of systems. Everything will be a system. In the long run, that's a heavy loser. That'll get you a lump of coal in a sock, a spiritual cardboard box to live in. As I reconstruct the legend of Merlin, one of my favorite guys, I put him in my sights as the one who taught himself magic by abandoning all systems. That was his genius. Don't misunderstand. He didn't turn himself into a blithering idiot. He just stepped outside systems. He went down roads based on his own naked desire to make magic. To modern man, 
this makes no sense. The intellectual enrolls at Harvard. He studies anthropology for six years. He flies to a jungle in South America. He digs up remnants of a lost culture. He infers they performed arcane ceremonies six times a week. He writes monographs and he concludes they were a very picturesque society with fascinating customs and totems and their brand of magic can best be understood as an inevitable consequence of their matriarchal organization, which itself was an accommodation to rainfall levels. The anthropologist takes to Paxel and goes off to teach a class on the meaning of ancient eyebrow trimming in Tierra del Fuego. The rocket of real magic is still on the launching pad. It's waiting. Systems are wonderful things. They produce results. They take us into technological triumphs. They help us become more rational. But when they are overdone, when the mind itself becomes shaped like a system, it reaches a dead end. Then the mind works against the unquenchable desire for magic. Then society is organized as a tighter and tighter system. It turns into a madhouse. And then people say, maybe machines can actually think and choose and decide. Maybe machines are alive. What would happen if we grafted computers onto our brains? It might be wonderful. People move in the direction after their own minds have been shaped, like putty, into systems. They don't see much difference between themselves and machines. When you have a world run by a million machine systems, you encounter horrific problems. One of those problems stems from the fact that each system gets things a little bit wrong. Each system is skewed to one side just a little bit. And when you add up all these wrong little bits, you get a real threat to basic survival. The whole ship of civilization is tilting dangerously in the water. Far worse than that, the deep desire for magic in every individual is squashed. That's the real problem. So the first order of business is the restoration of imagination from which all magic flows. Imagination is sitting right there, always ready to go, waiting. Imagination is saying, the mind has been shaped into a system. I can undo that. I can literate the mind and make it into an adventurous vessel. I can provide untold amounts of new energy. Life is waiting for imagination to revolutionize it down to its core. Since imagination is a wild card that technocrats can't absorb in their systems, they pretend it a faculty produced by the actions of atoms in the brain. They pretend it is a delusion that can be explained by demonstrating, for example, that a machine can turn out paintings or poems. You see, we don't need humans to make art. Computers can do just as well. Imagination isn't mysterious at all. Technocracy and transhumanism flow from the concept that the human being is just another machine. And any machine can be made to operate more efficiently. Of course, that operation must conform to overriding objectives that define what efficiency is geared for. Objectives like acceptance, surrender, group integration. The result? Society is organized to eliminate all outliers and rebels. And many people believe that the system called civilization will give them security, protection, hence the willingness to go along with the surveillance state. Well, I don't commit crimes, so I'm okay. The system won't punish me. It'll guard me against all those other people. Meanwhile, imagination waits. It never vanishes. It stands by just in case an individual decides to live a life that overflows with creative power. If my work is any organized precedent, it is ancient Tibet where 1,500 years ago, before the priests took over with their interminable spiritual baggage of ritual, practitioners engaged in exercises 
that engaged imagination to the hilt. The entire goal was revealing that the universe was a product of mind. This was not about ultimate worship. This was not about some deep substrate in the universe that one could plug into to guide his actions and thought. It was about liberating the individual from all systems. It was about endless creation. The first teachers of this way came from India, where they had been pushed out of the academies of orthodox religious instruction. They were rebels. They had offloaded the metaphysical labyrinths of control. They were, in a sense, artists. Artists of reality. They were brilliant riverboat gamblers and, in Tibet, for a time, they found a home. They found students who, as now, were tired of the preaching designed to make humans into sophisticated mind machines. These people wanted more. They wanted to awaken their own imaginations and exceed the illusory boundaries of space and time. They wanted magic, despite every cynical ploy. That desire is still alive.